This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. And I'm Sam Mercier's. And joining us this week, successfully this try, is longtime friend of the show, uh, and I will say it here, strongest beard in new music, Rob Deemer. Rob has a uh, new concerto for clarinet, doubling bass clarinet, that was premiered with the president's own. That's a great gig if you can get it. And he also was a part of a panel last year about developing new core curriculum standards for primary and secondary education. Is that correct? Primary yep. and secondary for uh, how music theory and composition fits into that. And we're going to spend some time talking about that. Rob, welcome back. Good morning, guys. And, and um, we should say, sorry to interrupt so quickly, the president's own, for those of you that are not in like the, the world of playing it <laughs> at, at Wind instruments is the Marine Band, the the top Marine Band in DC. They're like one of the best. Yes. Just just they in case you didn't know what that was. It's it's a serious, uh, you know, on the level with symphony kind of audition stress level auditioning for that group. They do not miss notes. Yeah, and then and then you have to go through some lightweight basic training, but but you still then you have to get to be in the band. So Rob, one thing I wasn't clear on: the person who premiered the uh, the piece was that the principal clarinetist, or was that just a, a different soloist? No, actually, uh, Jay Nee Peter, who is uh, the clarinetist who who commissioned the work, he actually is their principal bass clarinetist, and uh-huh. uh, he he and I have known each other for many years. He actually graduated from Northern Illinois University the year before I started my freshman year there, way a long time ago. And uh, uh, last year he contacted me and, and asked if, he, if I would be willing to write him a piece. And, and so he personally uh, commissioned the work and he was able to get the Marine Band to agree to play it. And so yeah, last, last week uh, they performed it twice. Nice. So it's just a piece you wrote for a friend and he got some of his buddies to play it with him. Yeah, more or less. It just, you know, it was it was a it was kind of a ad hoc, you know, throw it together kind of thing. Yeah. No, it was it was it was amazing. It was it was That's a awesome. wonderful experience. Now, had he requested at the beginning for it to be it is clarinet doubling bass clarinet, correct? Yep. And had he asked uh from the beginning for that to be the way it works? He did. Uh we we had a lot of discussions on that in terms of whether or not it should just be a bass clarinet piece. Um but he's actually soloed several times on clarinet with with the ensemble but he's i'm not sure if he's ever soloed uh with the bass clarinet he may have with one piece the problem is is that there's very few uh pieces in the repertoire for bass clarinet and wind band and so he thought this was an opportunity to uh, expand that repertoire but at the same time give him a chance to be able to uh you know basically show off both of his axes yeah well it's just like a lot of many instruments, uh, they've kind of come into their own as we've gotten further, you know, made it through the 20th century, I guess. And now there's all kinds of um, sort of the literature creates the expectation for the players, I think, you know. And uh, 60 years ago, what were you expected to be able to do on a bass clarinet? Read it in bass clef for one thing. Um, but these days, the clarinet players that schools are cranking out can do just about anything you might expect. The same way you expect this, I think it's a single reed thing too. The single reed instrument is capable of so much, so many calisthenics and gymnastics that, and it goes for any of the instruments. Exactly. So, uh, I think it's a it's a great uh, it's a great target for contemporary pieces because of all the flexibility. <coughs> well, it's it's been interesting. I think probably over the past maybe twenty twenty five years or so. Uh, the bass clarinet has uh, moved up in in stature in in the musical world. Uh, there's been so much uh, written for bass clarinet in in new music circles. Uh, I think the the emergence of a lot of Perot uh, instrumentation uh, in the new music scene has gotten a lot of clarinetists thinking, okay. Um, if I'm going to play clarinet, I'm going to probably have to play bass clarinet as well. And so you find more and more that bass clarinet is not an auxiliary instrument as much as an, a, you know, there's a lot more, more performers who actually see it as, as a real instrument in and of itself and not just something that is kind of shuffled off to the fourth chair clarinetist or something like that. 
Right. And something that we've witnessed firsthand here on the show, we have, on Sound Notion 126 way back, we had Squonk uh, right. on the show. Anyone not familiar, Squonk is a bass clarinet duet. That kicks and, ass. Uh, that oh, kicks yeah. Ass. And they demonstrate, and, and also the single read thing, any kind of sound that's not a straight tone, like slap tonguing and creating multiphonics, not everyone, but a lot of the, and even altissimo, a lot of the things that are like the extra things that uh, composers have really taken advantage of are actually easier to produce and to produce with a lot more volume and control in different situations the bigger the read is. Right, so, right. <coughs> well, and these... Of, these okay. days, you've you've got you've got performers like Michael Lowenstern, uh, you know, in New York City. In addition to Squonk, you also have the the bass clarinet quartet Edmund Wells, based out in 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 San Francisco, and a bunch of other performers around the around the country and and over in Europe as well, uh, who are really kind of pushing the uh, the instrument. The interesting thing about this gig um, was I got a chance to write for a really good bass clarinetist with Jay Niepeter, Um but also the fact that you had you kind of had to make sure that you're like all right now you have the opportunity to write um, for a virtuosic performer and a virtuosic ensemble and you're you're spot on with with your with your description they literally can play anything I mean these guys are the so many of the performers in the group were just my draw was dropped the entire time um, but at the same time the context of the concert that we were that they were performing this on was basically the Marine Band's summer concert series. Mm -hmm. It was the first concert in their summer concert series, which happened on the steps of the U.S. Capitol, which is fun for me. Uh, but at the same time, you had to keep in mind that, okay, all of those things that you just listed are like, okay, do I really want to pull out the slap ton? Do I really want to pull out any extended techniques on a concert that basically had Sousa and uh, <laughs> waltzes and there was a list thing and there was a, a Irish... Uh, song set. I mean, all of these kind of popular tunes, and so I had to come up with a way to be able to make the piece interesting for these performers, but at the same time, thread the needle and make sure that it was it was technically challenging, but not so challenging and not so uh, um, off-putting to a typical you know capital audience. I mean, these are folks who are literally just walking around Washington, D.C. and happen upon uh, an open-air concert on the steps of the Capitol and walk up and check it out. So You had to yeah. write it like you're a professional composer who knows what he's doing, is what you mean. Uh, I faked it pretty well, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I actually kind of envy that situation, like to, to, to get to write something for a great player and a great group and to get your new music sort of cred out of it, considering the context it's going to be performed in, you don't have to go very far to make it sound <laughs> sort of fresh and new. And, and it was just like getting to write something that, that, that group that good, you know, it yeah. doesn't have to be far reaching in any kind of way other than just fun for me to write a roller coaster for him to ride on. That well, would be a blast. One of the things that Jay and I talked about a lot was the idea of writing a piece that not only the audience would, 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 like and I, I told him that if the performers are enjoying themselves, the audience is going to like it. So I don't really write as much for the audience as I do for the performers. If they're if they're happy with it, I'm sure the audience is going to be happy with it. Um, but at the same time, I also wanted to make sure that I wrote a piece that more than one person would be able to play. Right. right. So you you wanted to be able to write something that is going to interest other clarinetists. Um, and I've already had a few. Folks in some of the other military bands who've heard about it say, "Hey, can I check this thing out?" So, that that I'm hoping that it has some legs. Very nice. That's awesome. And uh, so, why don't we go ahead and give that a listen, Dave? Yeah. Uh, Rob has generously give us given us an excerpt. Do you need to set this up at all, Rob? Sure. Well, this is uh, basically the piece is kind of a, a three part thing where it starts out kind of uh, slow and pretty with the clarinet. Uh, you know, I, I did not uh, Xerox Copeland's concerto, but, you know, I, I kind of figured that it would be in that ballpark um, with a lot of bells and stuff like that. And then in the middle part, the bass clarinet kind of goes crazy and has a whole bunch of notes. Uh, and then uh, the clarinet comes back at the end and has a nice little duet with the bass clarinetist in the band. 
which is fun because a it kind of gives you a sense of an echo of the bass clarinet that you just heard but at the same time i also know on a personal level that jay who is the soloist is also really good friends and has been friends with the other bass clarinetist in the group and they've known each other since high school so it gave me a chance to be able to kind of do a little personal uh, uh, thing between the two of them, give them a chance to do a duet in the piece. Uh, but if it gets played by someone else, everybody is just like, oh, that's cool. The clarinet and the bass clarinet. It's almost like you have an offstage bass clarinet, you know, echoing what you heard earlier. Uh, so, and then what you're going to hear is kind of the bass clarinet has just finished all of his, uh, you know, playing of thousands of notes. And uh, it's kind of a transition into, into that. And then you'll get to hear the duet with, between the two. Okay. Right. That was an excerpt from Rob's new concerto for clarinet and bass clarinet performed by the president's own Marine Band. And uh, I'm going to butcher this person's name, Jay Niepater? Niepater. Niepater. Uh, did, did you on, see how I tripped Rob into saying his name part. earlier? <laughs> <laughs> Earlier, I, 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 I tricked Rob into saying his name for me. That's the way to do it. That was very sneaky of you. Yes. Um, I really enjoyed the uh, the duet there, and I was gonna I wanted to, I wanted to say before the clip, but I didn't want to interrupt that it's always an interesting thing to me when the composer decides to include or not include the instrument uh, of the the focus of the concerto in the orchestra. 
Right. Um, like we had Stephen Bryant on the show recently. He just finished a piece for Joe Luloff and MSU Wind Ensemble. And there's a section where the saxophone in the ensemble, the alto and, and the soloist are going back and forth. And I always think it's a, it's, it's a great tool to like give a different kind of counterpoint to the soloist. You know, the same instrument is always a different kind of thing. The way they blend is always going to be a unique thing that you can't get any other way. Definitely, definitely. We and we actually talked about whether or not there should be any clarinets in in the ensemble at all. Uh, mm-hmm. They've done that before, uh, but yeah, with with something like this, I mean, especially with with uh, a big group like this, you'd, you'd, I I couldn't imagine not including clarinets and bass clarinets and contrabass clarinets in the group. Yeah. Well, and I think it's a nice way to show some respect to the ensemble. Like, you know, they've got some pretty good players there too. It's not just, very much and, so. And, and that that's something that always I I always really like seeing performances like this where the soloist is a member of the ensemble. Yep. It, you see it. It seems like it's pretty rare, even with major orchestras. Um, but I and, and they do sometimes. You'll you'll see a horn concerto, and it'll be the principal horn playing the solo part. But most of the time, it's an outside person. But I always think, you know what? That person's a principal horn in that group because they're a pretty damn good horn player. And the same thing is true. This, like, this guy is in this ensemble because he's a pretty damn good clarinetist. Right? So I, I think that's really, really cool to, to reflect that with, the, with the, the ensemble part as well. And also, there's, if you get rid of it, you're missing out on a lot of possibilities, like you were saying, right. of all those different clarinets playing together and in counterpoint with one another that really lets you see the solo instrument in a different light, which is part, I think, of the purpose of a concerto, is to look at all of the different aspects of an instrument, right. uh, or at least a lot of them. And I think that's really hard to do without showcasing its relationship kind of with itself in the ensemble. Well, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because one of the, the special aspects of the Marine, of the Marine band and the top military bands, uh, across the board is that basically the entire ensemble is made up of soloists. Um, you know, it's, yeah. it's part and parcel with the gig that, uh, not only are you playing in the ensemble, but you're, they, they give them opportunities to play chamber music, uh, and to solo with the ensemble all the time. In the same concert that this piece was played, they also brought up one of the euphonium players, and he played this uh, just, you know, knock your socks off uh, uh, tour de force piece for euphonium. Uh, and he he was one of the newest guys in the group. Uh, so it, and, and that happens at every one of the concerts. So it's fr- yeah. Freshly minted DMA student. Who yeah, just- probably a UT guy too, right? Uh, actually, I think he was probably uh, North Texas. Oh, uh, uh, obviously, yeah. We, you know, right. And and so it it's it was so much fun to get to meet some of these folks who are like, yeah, we talk about, uh, you know, it's kind of like a punchline. Well, where are you going to get uh, a a paying gig as a euphonium player except for the Marine Band? <laughs> right. And so like, okay, I got to meet one of the two guys or one of the four guys who actually has a paying gig playing euphonium. <laughs> uh, so that was that was a lot of fun, but it. it 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 did getting to write for the military bands was really interesting for me uh, because I think it is obviously it's very different from writing from an orchestra um, and and the attitude uh, that they were bringing was I think much more open to new music. They play a lot of new music during their their regular season. They don't do as much over the summer, but they have a concert series in the fall and the winter that they play all sorts of stuff. They they uh, commissioned. Uh, Ten of a Kind, which is a work by David Rakowski, and he was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for that piece. Uh, mm. So they can pretty much, as far as playing new music, you couldn't do much better than a group like this. And it's also interesting for me because I know a lot of my colleagues who write for concert band tend to work with college groups. And that's great. There's a lot of really amazing concert groups or uh, college bands that that do a lot of amazing things. But what was different for me uh, with working with the Marine Band was if you're working with a college group, pretty much your relationship is more or less with uh, the conductor, right? Because year to year, the group's going to change. Mm-hmm. In the Marine Band and in each one of the the, uh, the military bands, those guys are there. You know, Some of these guys have been playing in the group for 20, 25 years. So 
it's oh. much more of a of a cohesive like you're 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 creating a relationship with the entire ensemble, not just the guy with the baton. So yeah. that was really interesting to me that 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 dynamic uh, and hopefully potential dynamic for future projects um, that I think will 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 be a little bit different than if I was working with a college group. That's really interesting. It's not something that I would have initially thought of. Uh, I, was that, was that a surprise to you that that, that very much so? Thing? Very much so. I mean, it was it was they. I learned a lot in terms of how uh, the whole thing is structured. They actually have three conductors uh, that kind of they divvy up all of the uh, the different responsibilities. Um, and actually, I talked a lot with Ryan, who was um, one of their arrangers and recently is just being commissioned as one of their new uh, directors because the concert that this this uh, this piece was played on was the last concert for. Michael Colburn, who has been their director for the past 10 years or so, and he's been with the group for 25. And so he's going to be retiring. He's actually going to be teaching at Butler University this fall. Mm. So that was also it was a, it was a special thing for me to be able to uh, write a work. And the, the work actually, it's, it isn't a concerto per se. It's, it's entitled Home. It's a feature work. It's about 10 minutes long. Um, and Jay has already talked to me about, well, you could add another movement or two and turn it into concerto. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, it, was, it was written in a way that I kind of wrote it as a, as a gift to Jay, but I also gave it as a little g- bit of a gift to Michael as well because he, he was finishing up his tenure with the group on these concerts. So that was a lot of fun. That's really nice. cool. That's really cool. Um, and, and, and it's really... I think this is the first time we've talked to somebody about writing for the the military bands, but we have this conundrum in in the United States all the time about how little support the arts get from from the federal government. And this is one really precise example where the whole thing, like from from soup to nuts, is 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 a is a government make work project around the arts and making cool yeah. new things. Right, right. Although I, I will, I, I, I do have to say, uh, you know, to, to, to be completely transparent, this wasn't a commission by, uh, the, by the Marine Band. Uh, this well, yeah. actually came out of the pocket of, of Jay. He, he, he felt very strongly he wanted to, to write a piece, and so he basically talked, with, talked to his wife and said, hey, is this something that we could, we could afford? And, and, uh, yeah, so they, they, they asked me and, and commissioned me out of, the, out of their own pockets. But yes, the idea of getting to work with, um, an organization like this that is completely, uh, supported by the, uh, uh by the government and they're able to bring in a lot of, um, amazing music into the, into that community, I think it's they're only kind of scratching the surface of what they could do. And I think if more composers saw the military bands as a resource that they could use and, and work with, I, I, I think that, that you, could, you could push that a lot further than, than what it has been in the past. Well, and it's also, I think, a great resource for not just us as composers and part of the kind of creative side of, of that whole of, of the arts community, but they do a lot of outreach. They play Very concerts so. like all day long, <laughs> and yep. most of them are free. They uh, do a tour. They do a tour every year uh, that goes to different communities. And uh, Jay was telling me these tours. He, the he, sh- he showed me that their tour schedule. It was a month long, like thirty days on the road, with only two days free. So every single night they're in a different city. He said that within a five-year period, uh, they they like to say that within a five-year period they've played within a hundred miles of anyone in the country. Wow! Mm-hmm. So, a- so they, and they they so they don't just go to the big cities. They go to all these kind of mid mid-sized and smaller towns uh, that they know that they can fill fill a house. But they they do all sorts of outreach. Uh, it was really a lot of fun to be able to to get a sense of of what they do, and it was interesting because I know not too long ago um, I saw on Facebook um, that Michael Colburn was talking about one of their concerts that they were doing in in the regular concert series, 
And, and I, I know in part of the conversation that, that came up out of that thread was the fact that like, hey, why doesn't the Washington Post ever come down and, and <laughs> review some of their concerts, right? And it's, again, it's one of those, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's come up before, but there is a bit of a bias in the classical music, uh, you know, community. Um, if it doesn't have strings, if, if it doesn't have a string section, it doesn't quite have as much cachet. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's hard for folks outside of the band world to see a band concert or, or a piece for wind band as having quite the same um, level of, of whatever yeah. Uh, then something with strings, and and of course I totally disagree with that. There's I, I love writing for orchestra, and I love writing for strings, but uh, there's nothing to say that you can't find amazing music written for wind band as well. It's, it's funny wow. that you mentioned that because when you said earlier that a piece that was uh, premiered by the Marine Band was nominated for a Pulitzer, that's the first thing I thought of was whoa, yeah. a band piece nominated for a Pulitzer. <laughs> Like that that mm-hmm. simply does not happen and i know it, yeah. it has happened but if it, it you're right there is kind of this feeling that things written for wins are not as artistic or not as as worthy or whatever as as music as you say that, that has strings like yep. string quartets and oh. uh and, and string orchestras uh but i think Another part of that, at least for something like the Washington Post, which I was actually looking for a review of this concert earlier to see if I could uh, see what other people had to say about it. And of course, good luck with that. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> uh, I'm sure if there were one, you'd have pull quotes. Uh, but um, I, part of it could seem seems to me could just be fatigue. Like if you, if there's something that is happening as often as the Marine Band is happening. It might be a little bit harder to to get the attention of of a classical music critic that's there every week, but I, I'm sure every I mean, does does the Washington Post review every weekend's concert at the National Symphony? I don't know if they even I don't, do that. I don't know, but I, I I think it's one of those things where, um, you know, obviously you know, kind of pulling it out a little bit, uh, panning out to the full new music scene. Yeah, um, there's there's always a, a conversation in terms of how little new music there is and and how you know what can we do to increase its footprint and and what and and all of that and i agree with that to a point and i think there are certain instances where yes it's absolutely inexcusable for major symphony orchestras to not have any new music and especially new music by american composers especially if they're an american symphony all of that fun stuff um but I think we also want to make sure that we're not excluding all of the new music that is being performed. It just d- isn't being performed at the right venues for people. There are certain venues and there are certain cities that if the folks are, are kind of like, well, if it doesn't happen here, if it doesn't happen here, it doesn't happen here. Well, and one then of those we're is not, in New York, right? Well, I, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, you could, it's most of the city. I mean, it's most of the country. Seriously. I mean, there's, there's a few cities that, if you get your piece played in, that means more to people in the whatever uh, than than if you had your the same exact piece played in in one of the cities that's not on their radar. It's, and, it's funny. I mean, I'm sure you have this experience being in in Western New York as well. But you have like friends and colleagues that you'll read about in the paper that did a thing in New York, and you're like, well, I had stuff too, right? Yeah. Like. Mm-hmm. The, but they were in New York, and so they're yeah. they're in the Times. If I, I've had, it, if you have a piece played at a concert in downtown Manhattan, uh, and forty people come, and five of those forty people are the right people, uh, that event has much more weight in the new music community than a concert that would have. Two to three hundred people come to it, maybe on the other side of the state or in another state or in another city. Uh, so it's really, I mean, it, I'm, I'm not sure if there's anything you can do about that. I mean, it's kind of the, the nature of the beast. But I think it is one of those things that, that we in the community need to think of in terms of if everybody's focused on getting their works performed in 
these certain halls in these certain cities by these certain ensembles, that's pretty limiting. And, and to say that that's only like that, that is the, the, uh, um, that things that are not outside of that, that circle aren't legitimate new music or however you want to call it. I mean, everybody call you know, talks about it in different ways. Um, but I feel that there's, there's a lot of good stuff going out there. It's just that people don't notice it. They don't know about it or they don't think it's necessarily in the same, in the same bracket. Well, and it can also be tricky, I think, because one of the things that gives it that cultural whatever of, of weight that you, you to use your word is the media coverage and there's just not as much media coverage in other places and and we we read all yep. the time about newspapers cutting back on their 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 arts critics and and their music critics especially their <laughs> classical music critics yep. um and and even even in new york I, f I feel like they're they're losing a lot of that so oh sure um well and and, and it's and it's the same thing in terms of if you get a review even in the chicago tribune or the la times or something like that yeah that's good but have you gotten but a review in, the New, in the New York Times or in the New Yorker mm -hmm. or right. in the Washington? I mean, there's there's really only a few media outlets, uh, which ties into one of the subjects we're probably going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, that that media uh, stranglehold that you have. Yeah. That there's only a few people, really, that people that 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 folks in the industry kind of respect as ah, if you got reviewed by this person in this in this. Uh, uh, media outlet then you're golden if not it's like oh that's nice to me it's about cultural capital like if uh in new york city you have places played in the right spots and viewed by the right people that generates a certain kind of cultural capital that you're able to leverage for whatever um i think that composers in the flyover states as an example have to figure out different ways to lever leverage some cultural capital out of the things that they produce and it might take a totally different form. It might be only through online connections does this happen. And it might not be as potent as what you might be able to get by Alex Ross saying your music is awesome. Right. But it might be more connected. Like the capital that you get might come from real connections where people uh, latch onto your music and help spread it, not because they're a reviewer and their job is to have an opinion, but because it grabbed them in some way. So who knows? Um well, I find it's it's really it, one of the things that I always uh, try and talk about with my own students is trying to get your music out into the community um, and not worrying so much in terms of whether or not you're getting reviewed by a certain person or, or if you get pull quotes, as you mentioned. Uh, but just, I mean, if you can touch a community or, or communities with your music, uh, be it um, with, with uh, a really avant-garde, really kind of pushing the envelope piece for a chamber work or a work even that you've written for a sixth grade band or something for the military bands, you, you're able to actually with the military band, what I've been finding is that, yeah, that didn't get reviewed, but the fact that I got to write for an ensemble that pretty much everyone in the country knows. I mean, this is the group that sits right beneath the president when, when, they, when they do the inauguration. Everybody in the country knows of this group. And so that in and of itself, for me, that's, that's just as satisfying. That, that you know, if I'm walking down the street here in Fredonia, people will know what that means, as opposed to if I got to write for the Kronos Quartet, they probably haven't heard of the Kronos Quartet. So it, that's right. it's, it's it's just a different uh, metric of yeah. of of where you're getting satisfaction from. Yeah, and and this is not to sound like sour grapes. Like we're glad that all. those people are getting the the attention and 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 everything that they're getting for the performances that they're getting. But it is limiting and myopic to focus on just those things. There's a lot of great things that are happening in a lot of places. Exactly. And, and some of the things that we're talking about here are just a few of them, and there are even more right. than, than right. we can even talk about here, um, you know, right right now on this show. Composers uh, shouldn't be afraid of, of, of taking opportunities that are outside of, of those traditional circles. Yeah, and, and right. I'm sure you all get this question from your students all the time. I know I hear this a lot. Uh, it, this, this question comes up on, on a, at least a couple of times a semester and I never know how to answer it 
the student asks, how do I get my name out there? <laughs> like, not only do I not know what that means. <laughs> Where's out there? <laughs> I don't know where out there is. I don't know what your name is going to do when it gets there. Right. I don't understand the value <laughs> of that concept. You could yeah. say something really stupid and piss a lot of people off. That would get your name out there. Sure. Exactly. It's not necessarily worth it, but we're talking to you, Daniel Asia. Um, hey oh. <laughs> um it's 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 worth mentioning to me that these students, even the ones that really think of or trying to think of themselves as a composer, the way sort of success and the way it's presented in the media outlets to them, there's so much fame for famous sake that that's like being having your name be out there and recognizable is sort of like considered the first step in success. Yes. Like become famous and then use your fame to sell or market whatever it is the thing is going to be. But the the we sort of modern uh, sort of entertainment teaches I think the kids to think of the fame as the first thing and not the result of a bunch of other things. Yeah, let's get good at something and then tell people about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of getting good at things, um, yes, last year Rob Deemer, friend of the show, took place took part in a panel that was set up to sort of revamp the way we think about uh, music standards for primary and secondary education. Around theory um, and composition in particular. Around theory and composition in particular, since those and beard growing are Rob's uh, areas of expertise. His core competencies. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like the way uh, this is sort of broken down. It has, I want Rob to talk about it in a little more in detail, but just to give it a, a quick breakdown, it's got the, the biggest categories you see are called creating, and then broken down inside that, and then performing. So, you know, making something, performing something, uh, and those all, in court, of course, include little subcategories. Responding, to me, this is a big one, like like <laughs> processing the, your inner thoughts about what you're hearing or experiencing in some way that makes sense and doesn't just let it wash over you. And then connecting, which uh, and to me is another really strong one that has to do with connecting um, your interests as a musician or a composer to other creative aspects of your life and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Rob, uh, why don't you just give us a sort of tell us what the 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 impetus for getting that panel together in the sure. beginning was and, and give us a breakdown of this as you see it. Well, this this is... Um... This, this whole experience basically comes out of not just music, but entire arts, the arts um, across the, the country. Basically, they, in 1994, um, a bunch of folks got together from the different organizations and came up with uh, arts standards. And they actually had nine different uh, categories within those standards that basically drove the curriculum and drove how people were teaching. And they were saying that these things are things that we expect uh, arts educators to do in the public schools. And so this now being 2014, what is that, 20 years later, they've decided to, to revamp those standards. So instead of having nine different categories, they have three, creating, uh, performing, and responding. Um, and so then what they did was they've broken them down into the different disciplines. Uh, so arts or art, uh, dance, theater, whatnot, and music. Um, and then the music broke it down into different categories of, um, oh God, general music, like, like, um, general music, um, uh, instrumental music, um, Probably you know, non music. non traditional non traditional oh. uh, things like rock bands and stuff like that, and Ooh. theory composition was one of the other um, was one of the categories uh, because it is expected that at the very least students are getting some form of of theory, and you know I'm happy to hear that they're also expecting students to to see composition as a skill that that should be taught in the schools, and so what they did was they created these little subcommittees uh, that then put these these uh, rubrics together that went back to the general music committee they tweaked things they gave it back to us it was about a year and a half process of going back and forth uh, and then finally it got 
put into the document that you were showing. This is basically to help teachers to be able to n at least have an idea of what to do when they're working with their students. So if you, if you looked at the, at the document, um, it has five different categories across, but basically the novice and intermediate have to do more with, with uh, K through 8. And so our, our charge was to deal with primarily with high school. So the okay. K through 8 folks were dealing with, there's a separate document for them. Uh, because you're dealing with with students who who are just barely, you know, getting the rudiments of music together. At once you're in high school, you at least have you you can expect a certain amount of of musical experience. So you don't have to t tell them what a quarter note is, so and so forth. Um, but basically, what you have on the document is you have proficient, accomplished, and advanced, and that's just if you have a student who's really good. They've been composing since they were in sixth grade, and they're a junior in high school. The teacher can say, "Oh, let me take a look and see what are the things that that uh, I could do to to help them. What's what's the difference between working with an advanced student as opposed to someone who's just starting?" So the idea of the proficient uh, rubric is basically a high school student who has never composed before, and so how do you get them started? Accomplished is maybe someone with a year or two experience, and then advanced is you know every once in a while you get someone who's just really really good, and then they can kind of uh, help to nudge them in, in different ways. Um, and so in the creating, which is the one that we, we focus on the most, I mean, the, the performing and the, and the responding, we wrote them in, uh, but the creating was, was one of, was, we felt was the most important because that's actually, um, going, taking them through the creative process. What does that mean? So the, 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 the breakdown is that you first start getting the student to imagine what a piece could be. Um, it was interesting because some of the conversations we had with, with administrators and, and, and other teachers was they were already thinking that there was notes being involved, like they were already mm -hmm. putting notes down on the page. I was trying to keep things as, uh, as general as possible. I mean, so it, the, the very, for very first one Imagine under proficient says, describe how sounds and short musical ideas can be used to represent personal experiences, moods, visual images, and, and or storylines. So basically, if you're working with a student who's never composed before, you can say, here's a picture. Student, imagine ways that either sounds or musical ideas could be used to represent that picture. Is that They're how you address at, your students? Um, say that again. That's how you address your students. Student. Student. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Citizen. Student. No, no, no. Of course not. Uh, but it's it, it's one of those things where where uh, it it allows the teacher um, a clear idea of what the process is, rather than just okay, write some notes down. Now let's play with it. No, it's like if you think of what a piece could be, and then figure out. What, how that piece might be structured, which is the planning part, and then actually start playing around with notes, making, making musical ideas, and then evaluate what, whether or not you like that or not, and then go back and change things or refine it, and then actually put it together. That's, that's a much more clear uh, sense of what a creative process could be for a high school student rather than just, oh, okay, now start on do, and it needs to have a four-bar phrase, another four-bar phrase. You know, it's it's it. People tend to come at it from the, the the perspective of a theory exercise, and we tried to incorporate theory and show how theory could be used. But at the same time, if you're actually creating a piece, we r tried very hard to to make sure that it was true to to a, a more honest creative process. Well, I like the fact that to me, and, and David can tell you, I harp about form all the time. And, you know, if you had a student who actually went through this process and it's described to me like under make and plan, under creating, it's basically describing more and more complex ideas about form. Yeah. Um, and so if you had a student that, that went through the mental exercise of conceiving of music in this way, then when you actually teach them composition lessons in college, you might get a first piece that has a form that makes some sort of sense instead of what most of the time you get. The form is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, you know, right. like that. Right. Um, so I think this is 
perfect as far as getting people to think in a composerly way because you can come up with all the cool notes you want, but if you can't figure out how to make it into something that has a shape that is really what people perceive when they hear your music, you know, then that's what you're working on. That's what I'm working on with student composers is getting to think about it in that way. I mean, if they can't come up with a melody to save their soul, I'll work on them with coming up with a melody too. You know what I mean? And, uh, but yeah, this is a great set of standards. I think, um, I haven't, and and these this is free to share with the public, correct, Rob? Yeah, definitely. It's it's out there. The entire all of the standards are out there, and um, you know, hopefully, educators will be will be putting them into into practice. I mean, the, we tried to keep things as open as possible, so that we weren't being so prescriptive. I mean, that's one of the tricky things about you know teaching uh, composers is is that uh, you know you don't want to um, tell them how to do it or, or what to do, but at the same time, uh, if you don't give them any direction, uh, yeah, they'll just wander through the wilderness. Well, so I'm curious, uh, Rob, who the, like, I guess, target student is for this kind of thing. Is, is this, so I, 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 I kind of think I've got a, an idea for who your target teacher is, mm-hmm. um, that has student who, who wants to teach composition does not know where to begin, which is certainly somebody that we want to help. But I'm curious, is this something that you are thinking about every student getting into, or is this something that is for students who are uh, in music or students who are particularly interested in composing, or is this for everybody? This is pretty much for everybody. The mm-hmm. idea of... And this is this is kind of you know me coming from my own experience. Um, there are a lot of folks who think that, uh, or or at least are under the impression that only the really talented uh, kind of natural composers should uh, be you know should be given the opportunity or or, or should be encouraged to compose, um, but. I'm a little bit more of a populist in, in this way in that I, I kind of feel like every student out there should be given the opportunity to try their hand at composing. They don't need to be able to write uh, a four-part fugue. They don't necessarily need to, to write um, you know, a masterwork. But in the same way, uh, say, in, in um, uh, creative writing, you know, it'd be silly to say that oh well we're only going to let the really talented writers write poetry or um you know students oh only the ones who really know what they're doing uh should be able to you know try their hand at photography or or visual art or even theater it's it, it's something that with music specifically it's really hard for people to get their wrap their heads around the idea that everybody can compose now obviously not everybody can compose to the level of, say, Stephen Stuckey, or or uh, you know, go down the list of who who whoever you want to 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 list. Um, but the idea of actually going through a creative process, using sound, using something that's pretty abstract, I think actually works um, the minds of students in a different way than if they're working with something tangible. Uh, like say sculpture or, or or paint or or f- even photography, um, if they actually have to imagine what something's going to sound like and then go through the process of trying to um, achieve that, uh, especially if they have to achieve that by working with others, by collaborating with performers and and others to be able to make that happen, that's a process I think that that anyone uh, would get a lot out of. Um, the the real the trick the downside to it is or, or the challenge with that is is that we tend to go into it thinking that if we do it wrong if we break the rules if it sounds quote unquote bad then we've failed and so a lot of people either try their hand at it and then pull you know pull you know dip their toe into the pool and then pull it out very quickly if if it doesn't uh, work right away. Or they just don't even do it because the risk, uh, the fear that um, that it's it's not going to work, uh, is so great that they're like, oh, I couldn't possibly do that, so I'm not even going to try. So we're hoping that this helps to kind of break down those those risks, 
give give uh, educators a little bit more of a structure in terms of how to be able to to achieve that, and then allow you know give them some tools with which to allow their students to still experiment and play in in the in the composition sandbox um, without so much of the baggage. That's interesting that you, that you say that because I think one of the things that we have to deal with a lot. Uh, is the idea that the thing that we do is like this magical thing that only special people can do. And obviously, you and I know, because we actually do it, that it's not a magical thing. Like, it's just working on stuff and hacking away at it, just like any other kind of project. Um, and it's it's cool that you're, you're getting people into this. Um, and one thing that I would think is a concern, I guess, is the, the end goal. And, I'm, and it sounds like you, you've thought of that uh, in, in what you were just saying, that, that this is something of benefit to everyone. And it's, it's always struck me is that oftentimes when I, when I look at documents like this and read about programs like this, the goal seems to be to make 60,000, 100,000 Stephen Stuckey's, which is, it's just, obviously not the goal, but to just get people to, to try to do this thing and think about music in this, this new and valuable and interesting way. Um, and so I think that's a, a very, a, a very valuable thing as well. Did you, is, is, is that something that you, you've laid out as kind of what the, the goal of, of all of this, uh, this whole process is? I haven't done that. I, I think it's kind of endemic in, in the, uh, um, you know, the greater goals of music education. Uh, the idea of music education is not something that should be um, uh, kind of cloistered with with just the few, uh, the proud, the talented. Um, but but it's really something that, um, you know, it, it it's it's the the uh, how 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 would one say it? The trip is more important than than the process by which you go through uh, learning music is more important than the end go- than the end product, yeah. uh, and I think anyone would say that they're they're not you're not expecting every single you know student violinist to turn out to be like Joshua Bell, right? But the the uh, the 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 value of what you are learning as you learn how to practice, as you learn how to work with others, as you w- learn how to uh, take direction and then also come up with your own ideas for interpretation. Those are so important no matter what you go into in, in a career or just what you do in your life. And I see one of – as as kind of a position that I'm now kind of inadvertently you know, finding myself in – as both someone who's a professional composer, but also someone who um, is very much interested and and experienced in music education, is that I can kind of bridge those two worlds, and and try to in, encourage music educators uh, to be able to uh, incorporate composition into their curriculum. Not only at the public school, I, and 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 I'll, I'll I'll throw this out as well. I think the real trick is that educators never get taught this stuff during their college curriculum. Yes. And so when they go out into the world and they're told, oh, and you're supposed to teach your students to compose. Or even worse is that they just find students coming up to them and say, hey, I want to compose. Show me how to do it. And, of course, they have no education. They, they have no training in it. They have no experience in it. And then they have to kind of – you know, basically half-ass it, and and uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. My big thing is if there's a way to be able to incorporate true composition, like actually get people to go through a creative process as they are going through their music education curriculum at the college level, then they have those tools and they have some experience in it so that when they work with students uh, out in the field, they have a clue of what they're talking about. Yeah, that's that's always really tricky, and I, I I feel that's another thing that we need to to do better in higher ed is is to get all of the the people in mu- in the music department writing at least some music while they're in college as well. Um, you, you said that you know we don't expect every violinist to be Joshua Bell, and I and I feel like we've kind of 
all as a as a music education pedagogical community figured that out like we've, right. we we understand that but it seems like there's still a disconnect when it comes to composition that that putting pen to paper means that you're basically your goal is to be beethoven and well and i think a lot of that comes you know basically from from uh you know your your typical what people outside of composition think but also there's a fair amount of folks in the composition community who uh see their job as only to teach uh the folks who are going to go on and become you know top notch composers and i'm not sure i agree with that i i think there is a lot of Sometimes it has to do with resources in terms of, oh, I only have enough time in my schedule to teach composition majors. Yeah. But if it, it, would, it would take a lot to change this. But if there could be more of a connection between uh, composition faculty at the university level and music ed faculty at the, composi- at the uh, university level and getting the composers to work with folks outside of their little circle and and actually instead of expecting the music ed faculty to teach the music ed students how to teach composition bring in the composers and let them help with that process um there there's there's too much of a stratification or silo uh, approach at, at the university level that you just don't see that very often and so what really needs to happen really can't happen because of the structure of it. And, and uh, uh, then it, it has ramifications because then students at, in, in, in junior high and in elementary school and even in high school, although elementary school they tend to uh, get a fair amount of composition. It's a little bit easier to teach kids uh, basic composing if you're only dealing with like a pentatonic scale and an ORF instrument. Right. Um, but by the time you get into junior high and high school, uh, most folks have this impression that it's it's too hard to incorporate composition into that, so that it never happens. And then we wonder why no one's interested in new music. No one has an idea of what the creative process is. It's it's a little bit frustrating, but I think you know, the more we talk about it, and the more we encourage folks, the easier it'll get. It's really interesting that you point out that low. It's not something I ever thought about, but it's certainly something that that I think I've observed where it's very easy to, to get little kids to, to do these kinds of, I, I think of them as like boxcar compositions where you kind of give them this rhythmic figure and this rhythmic figure and this rhythmic figure and this, and they have these boxcars and they just kind of put them in order mm-hmm. and they kind of make their their loops as you, almost as you would in a in a DAW in, in garage band or whatever. You right. kind of take these little pieces and loop them and then you've got this group over here with this kind of orf instrument and this group over here with this group. And that's a really valuable thing and it's a great way to start. And I feel like things get trickier when you move to later in junior high and high school of, of what that next step is. Because yep. there, there's got to be something between putting your 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 duta detas together and then on at the other end writing a concerto right there's there is there is something in between that and figuring out what it is is really tricky and i think one thing that i've had difficulty with in even teaching young undergraduate students is the idea of the things that they come the knowledge that they have coming in is really hard to predict Mm -hmm. and i I, i'm wondering how much you consider something like that in putting together these kinds of standards how much can i expect a student to know you talked about um faculty when you first started talking about this going directly to the idea of of putting notes on a staff and i feel like even that is is asking students to know how to do that and a right. lot of students even in even in high school don't and even even instrumental students who nominally read music don't do it outside of music for their own instrument right the 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 flute section doesn't read bass clef and right. the trombone section doesn't read tenor clef even so uh i mean where do you begin putting together a standard when the starting point is so 
unpredictable. Well, with something like this, it's in in standard. It's it's a funky terminology. It's it's I I, I wouldn't say that a standard is like a ceiling that you have to or a floor that you have to uh, achieve, uh, because every student is going to be different. And so what we created here in in these in these these documents um, isn't necessarily seen as something you must reach this level in order to move on. It's more of the idea of, okay, where is your student at? If they don't have, if they have very little experience with music notation, uh, we, were, we, were, we were very careful in saying all of the, the little rubrics say uh, sounds or musical ideas. So you could work with pitched material, like notes and so on and so forth. But if you wanted to work completely outside of pitched material and deal with soundscapes, you could do the same thing with this. Um, and so a lot of it has to do with, with kind of um, describing what the process is, but then leaving it really open to allow a teacher to conform what we've come up with to their own needs at that particular time with that particular student. Okay, so you're. I, I, I think I think I understand. Basically, you're 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 not getting down to that level of specificity, which I think is is good for exactly what, what I was asking about earlier. When you yep. don't know where the student is coming in, but also it allows you to deal with students that have very different creative goals, yep. um, but still. Uh, kind of have a structured way of helping them achieve those goals. Um, the other question that that I think comes up a lot when we're talking about music ed, music education in general, uh, is the idea of assessment. Mm -hmm. like, how do you assess that a student has achieved these things when you have to write a, a goal that is so general as you do for this that includes putting together a soundscape um, and, and, and writing dots and lines and writing a rock tune and creating mm -hmm. uh, a, a dance track on, in Ableton. Like right. if, if all of those things are good, worthy, creative goals, and they're all things that we can help students to achieve in, through a process uh, of 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 building on skills and and things like that how do we assess the goal in a way that includes all of those things how do we assess what they've done mm -hmm. i think it's it there's a couple things that you want to think of uh first you have very objective uh aspect musical musical aspects that you can assess if they're working in notation um are, are, is does the music look like music? You know, is the is the notation readable? Uh, is 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 it? You know, these are these are just kind of very. Um, it's either right or it's wrong. Those yeah. those types of things are pretty easy to assess. Um, but I think where it gets really squirrely with composition is that it is so subjective, and uh, it's very easy for a composer to say, "Well, that's what I like," and. I think that's where the first two parts of, of the plan that we've come up with really come into play because it's one thing to just say, oh, this is what I like because the teacher has no way to assess that. It's all in their head, right? But if the student has already worked with the teacher to describe their imagination, you know, what do they imagine? Like, like I said, the, the first part is imagining. The second part is planning. So what the teacher can do is look at, say, a rough draft of a piece and then go back to what the, the student said they wanted to do. They came up with an idea and then they planned out what the piece was going to be. And then you can, bait, you can take a look at what the piece turned out to be and compare it to what the plan was. Now, the trick with that is, is that you don't necessarily say, okay, you went in a different direction yes. than where your plan went, therefore you are wrong. Obviously, yeah. that's not right. But 
it's more of working with the student to go back to the plan and go, okay, look at what you've come up with, look at the plan, and that's where it says evaluate and refine. You evaluate whether or not you like where you've 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 come you've ended up compared to what the plan was, and then discuss with the teacher, okay, oh I actually I forgot I wanted to do this. Maybe I can I can adjust it or no, actually I turned left at Albuquerque back there. And uh, I actually like where I'm going. And you may actually have to go back and refine your plan, like replan a little bit to make sure that it's making sense and you aren't just kind of wandering musically. That's interesting that you say that because I think that's also something that you have to do as a composer in general, you know, outside of, of just, uh, you know, teaching composition and, and having a plan and being willing to change it and, and reevaluate your plan and restructure the plan but still have a plan is exactly the same thing you do writing music outside the context of that educational space. But one added challenge is that there is a time limit and we want students to experiment. We want yep. students to experiment and, and, and we want to experiment as composers and we have to, and I think in general we do understand that sometimes experiments fail and sometimes you'll, you'll, get to uh, a, a point of a piece or ha even having completed a piece and you hear it and you think, well, uh, I'm not going to do that again. And, and I think it's important if, if you are really trying to grow as a creative person to allow for those things to happen. And that can be very difficult in an educational setting mm -hmm. where there is a very firm deadline like the semester is over on May 4th and you need to show me what you have done for the last five months right and you better have something good uh, and and I think that is where things start to get tricky because mm -hmm. yes we want you to be able to fail but what happens when I have to assess you and you've the thing that you've created is something that, that you and I both agree did not succeed in some way. If, if it's outside of school, if I'm writing a piece and I look at it and say it failed, it's okay for me to say, well, I won't do that again. Or better yet, well, I guess I need to take a couple more weeks and, and hammer away at this thing that needs fixing. But that couple more weeks is not there when the registrar says grades are due Friday by 4 o'clock. Right. I think one of the... It, it depends on, on your, who you're working with a lot. Uh, but what I would, my thinking on that is that the way to get around that is to not think of it in terms of one big project that needs to be finished at the end of the term, right? But if you break it up into small chunks, into, into small things that they can fail internally, if that makes sense. Right? Yeah. The idea of you, you, you do one small project, that went great. Second small project, yeah, that was pretty good. Third small project, you fell on your face. Fourth small project, you got back up. And fifth small project, hooray, you, you, you were great. And so if, if you're able to break, you know, rather than just thinking, okay, everybody has one composition project over the course of a semester or a year, that's kind of like, well, if you're, if you, if you fail, then you fail. Like there's no chance to be able to do it again. Uh, and so, especially when you're working with young composers, and I would say this even in in through like the first year of of a composition degree at at the college level, um, I always work with students with small projects over the course of maybe two weeks, right? And so, it it's it's short enough that they can try their hand at something, but it's not so long that if it ends up not going anywhere. They don't look back at the last month and a half and go, "Oh my God, I just wasted my time." Yeah. So that it's it's. I think part and part. It's part of it is how you uh, you structure what what you're doing, um, and and make sure that you do allow for that as opposed to just thinking one big thing. Uh, it's it's. Um, you don't want to put students in the position where it's all or nothing on one project. Yeah. 
Well, and the, the, that idea of, of the smaller projects and giving them that, that kind of feedback on a regular basis, that feedback, I think, is really important as well. Exactly. And, and, and one of the ways they get that feedback is through hearing people play their stuff. And I yep. think uh, for, for and, and hearing not, not just themselves hearing it, but being in a situation where other people hear it. So right. if you know if you're writing dots and lines, obviously there's that that magical thing where you as as much as I hate talking about music in magical terms, where you hear a person play this thing and 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 that was just symbols on a page that you th threw together in the computer machine or with a pencil, and now it sounds and right. that's that's really cool, but but even for things like that soundscape be that happening in a situation where other people hear it yep. is 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 also a, a pretty profound experience and is i think the main way that at least i as a student composer got past that feeling of what the hell am i doing with my time right. in the room right. by myself is is getting that kind of feedback and that's one of the reasons i think it's really cool that you've got these other parts of this document about yep. performing and connecting yep. in here. Well, even the even the last section of create, uh, the creating, is um, is present. So it's not just that you've made something. It's not just that you've looked at it, you've tweaked it, and you get it to the point where you think it's good. But then you actually have to present it. You actually have to show someone the score and get their feedback. Or even better, you get someone to perform it. And and then by hearing it, I I really feel strongly about this. If I want to <clears throat> understand my own piece, I need someone else to listen to it, and I need to be sitting there while they're listening to it. Like I myself will hear my own music differently if I'm in the room with someone else who's hearing it. I will hear it kind of vicariously through them. I'll, it it will for, it will allow me to listen to it not as a composer but kind of put myself into the shoes of um, uh, kind of just uh, an, an audience member. And you need to be able to hear your music outside of yourself in order to re be able to really understand whether or not it works or not. And so, yeah, definitely. That, that If you're only writing music and you only get up to the point where you're like, okay, I think I'm done – you're not even you're not even close to being done yet. You still <laughs> right. have to actually you you still have to actually get it uh, read, and you have to hear that, and then that's part of the evaluation and refining process as well. Yeah, absolutely. I remember um, when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Missouri, I foolishly played in some jazz combos uh, on trumpet, and part of the grade for that class was to get a gig basically oh, yeah. get a gig and play a mm -hmm. gig right this is it's got to be not in one of the concert halls in the music building it's got to be either either in a common space at the university or better yet off campus and, right. and it's got to be a public thing that people can go to and it's we're not setting it up for you figure it out yep right and that's that was the thing so not only did we have to you know figure out what a real book was and, and learn how to, to hammer through the real book and, and write some things or arrange some things or whatever it was. We also had to then present it to people on our own. And that was a, a really valuable experience to me. I'm not, I'm a terrible jazz trumpet player, but that was a really valuable experience to me as a composer because I worked through that process more directly and in a more goal-oriented and supervised way than I ever did as as a composer. And I think that was probably even before I started writing a lot anyway. But I think that kind of experience for composers and for students in general who are, who are just interested in composition is the thing that makes all of the other parts valuable and worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, like you were saying that, you know, what have I been... What, oh, oh my God, I wasted all this time. And that's, that's what kind of gets past the, oh my God, I wasted all this time thing. Exactly. Um, which is basically what we do at home in our studios anyway, right? We sit here mm -hmm. and waste time. So what, what you at home <laughs> listening to this have been doing for the last hour or so, what, what are you doing with your life? You've made some very poor choices. Um, 
Listen, Rob, uh, we're, we've been running really long. And in fact, we ran so long that Sam actually had to go because he had a gig, uh, right. which is why it's just you and me now. Because Patrick is at the New York Philharmonic Biennial. Uh, Nate is driving down to Branson, Missouri for a music festival. And Sam is currently uh, gainfully employed as, I, I assume, a saxophonist. Could be a clarinet player. I don't know. I don't know what he plays. It's not never really been made clear to me. Um, but uh, thank you so much for being here. The only the only quick quick bits of news I want to bring up. Uh, we have a new NEA chair, Jane Chu, formerly uh, head of the Kaufman Center for the Arts in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm very excited. I wrote a little piece on the Sound Notion blog this week, which you can find at blog.soundnotion.tv. Um, it's our our Tumblr blog, and we try to uh, post to it a few times a week. Not always kind of editorials like this was, but. I'm really excited about it because of what she did at the Kaufman Center, because of who she is. She comes from a classical music background. The Kaufman Center presents operas and ballets and, and the Kansas City Symphony Orchestra. The previous NEA chair, Rocco Landisman, was a, was a Broadway theater owner and producer, which is obviously nothing wrong with that, but it's a different kind of thing. And, and I think uh, Jane Chu is going to understand the sorts of things that, that we're interested in on Sound Notion a little bit more. Um, and she also was able to make this thing in the Kaufman Center into this really amazing sense of, of civic pride. And the people in Kansas City feel an ownership of, of the Kaufman Center the way they feel an ownership of their, their Kansas City chiefs and their barbecue culture and things like that. Uh, in, a, in a way that I, I wish people felt about American contemporary music and and that's obviously really ambitious but i think that her experience doing that might help her to be able to to build something like that around classical music and opera and ballet in the united states and i'm, I'm really looking forward to what what uh what she has in in store she was just confirmed by the senate this week um and we're gonna try to get her on the show I don't make Excellent. any promises, but we're Excellent. gonna try to get her on the show. So um, that's that's the big the big news story from this week. Amazon also has a streaming music service. Uh, they're jumping in the fray with all the other streaming music services. It's a jukebox style service like Spotify or Beats. Um, and it, the 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 big concern right now, first of all, they do not have the largest record label. Uh, they don't have Universal is one of their their options i'm sure they're working on it i would be shocked if it didn't come in the next few months mm -hmm. um but this is i think really interesting they don't have any music newer than six months old which i imagine got them a much lower licensing fee but frankly that i'm totally okay with that for music in the intervening six months i've got spotify i've got youtube heaven forbid um and if if it's something i really can't wait six months for i'll just Wait, wait for it. I'll just buy it. I will buy. I will buy a track. I'm not gonna buy a CD though. That's that's crazy talk. I will <laughs> buy a digital download though. I have enough CDs, right? Awesome. My my world is littered with physical things. As you can see, Rob's world is littered with physical things. Um, he's he's completely surrounded. Um, so that that's gonna do it for our our news ish things this week. Uh, we'll be following those closely. Rob, thank you so much for being here. It's been great yep. talking to you. Thank you so much, David. Um, and it, where can people find out more about what, what you've got coming up? Oh, uh, that's a good question because my website is currently, uh, and we're, we're working on version 2.0, so that's hey. not a good thing. But basically, if, uh, if, if you look me up on SoundCloud, you can, you can hear some of my, my music there. Otherwise, you can follow me on Twitter or friend me on Facebook. You have anything coming up you want to plug? Uh, let's see. Well, I'm going to be driving up to Interlochen and doing my Interlochen gig uh, this next week. I'll be there for six and a half weeks. Um, and I've got several several projects coming up over the next year that uh, uh, nothing that I can I can think of right now that I can I can plug. Uh, yet because a lot of them aren't quite public yet, but uh, it's pretty exciting where yeah. they're going. Awesome. Well, we look forward to hearing about them, and we'll definitely stay tuned to to Rob's Twitter at Rob Deemer on on Twitter for for updates about that. 
Um, that's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. If you would like to learn about any of the things that we talked about, we'll have links to that document that we were just referring to that, that Rob worked on uh, in our show notes. We'll, we'll also uh, have, have links to the information about Jane Chu at the NEA and the new Amazon Prime streaming service, which I should say, if you already have Amazon Prime, is included in your Amazon Prime. So, And, and if you don't have Amazon Prime, you've made some poor choices. It's um, awesome. It's amazing. Uh, so consider it. It's a hundred bucks a year and you get like, they just throw new things that they give you for that hundred bucks in about every other month. And this last one was a pretty big one. So anyway, um, you can, you can find links to all those things on our site, soundnotion.tv slash S N. You can also connect with us on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on Tumblr. Uh, we are at sound notion as a group on Tumblr. I'm Dave McDowell. As I mentioned, Rob is at Rob Deemer. Sam is at house Goy. Um, if you would like to suggest a story or a topic for us, you can tweet it at us with hashtag SN Weekly, and that's a, a hashtag that we look at when we're putting the show together each week. You can subscribe to this show on iTunes, on Stitcher, wherever finer podcasts are aggregated. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that using our Amazon affiliate search links, the donate links, or best yet, just tell your friends, leave us a review in wherever your review places for podcasts are. iTunes is a good one. Um, and and that helps us out a lot. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again so much for watching or listening to the show. We'll see you back next week. <laughs>